This is Sean Kelly. What up, Sean? How are you, man? I'm fantastic, Herb, coming to you live from uh, New Jersey right now. Right on, dude. Hey, thanks again for joining me for, for another session. Happy uh, to be here. Yeah, man. Very excited. Today we have an awesome guest, Miss Sarah Hoagie. Sarah, what's going on? Hello from beautiful 80 degree Orlando, Florida. It's it's gorgeous. I just moved from uh, New York in uh, March, so I'm loving life right now. <laughs> awesome. You're not missing the snow, I bet. I'm not missing it. I think I will in like three to four years, but I'm just not there right now. Mm -mm. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, I, I'm from Michigan, and uh, I've been, I moved uh, to Vegas uh, 10 years ago, and I, I haven't missed it yet. So, <laughs> I think we, we, we did our time, right? It's kind of like going to jail, and we're finally out, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm super excited to have you on the show. We have some mutual connections. I've, I've heard a lot about you, and I'm, I'm oh, excited wow. to share your insights with our audience. So... First question, I always ask everybody to kind of kick us off with, uh, with your background, uh, share some of your experience with us. Sure, my background. So November was my 20th year in automotive. Um, I was recruited from automotive from the banking industry. And you're gonna laugh, I was recruited because I purchased a car through that new website that came out named Auto Trader 20 years ago. <laughs> so I um, bought a car and I refused to go to the dealership. I was. 22 year old girl i wasn't going to step into a dealership i submitted a lead they came to the bank i test drove the car around the parking lot it had to be a ford mustang because that's what i wanted and then um we negotiated and he said okay great well we got a figure and i'll we'll just wrap this up with some paperwork and i said well wait a minute i have a trade he goes oh well you didn't tell me you had a trade so i pulled all the stops um out like a, a Tor like horrible uh the 10 percent terrorist customer that you hope not that you never get and that was me and then i refused to go to the dealership i he I wanted him to deliver the car back to me um at the at the bank and the bank people loved it they were watching me negotiate a deal work a deal sign off on the paperwork so he, off he left with my Chevy Corsica with a huge dent in it, and I had a brand new Mustang. And a, a day later, he came back and he goes, you know what? I got to hire you. He goes, I need to hire you to work these terrorist customers that we're getting through this internet thing. And I'd like to hire you to um, be a salesperson. And I go, I don't know anything about selling cars. So long story short, um, I couldn't get promoted while I was working at the bank. I mean, when if you're at a bank, they kind of stay forever. They're like lifers. There was no moving up for me. I was a young 22 uh, year old girl, just like finished part of college. I wanted to move up. So off I went and I started selling cars. And my first day, I mean, in a ton of training in banking. So you're bonded with the bank, you are trained, there's a great cast, you're dressed appropriately. So I show up in my suit, at the dealership my first day, which everyone was looking at me like, who the heck is this blonde selling cars in a suit? And my training was, here are the keys, here's the cars, here's the dealer plate, the cars are on the parking lot, there's that box of a thing called a computer, good luck selling cars out of that. And and on, I went, so I, I literally cried my first day in automotive because I was like, what am I going to do? And many people don't know this, but I, was on my own. I've been on my own since I was 19. So I really needed to make some money. I needed to make a paycheck. I had to pay rent. Um, I really have paid for everything on my own since I was 16 years old. So um, I cried in the bathroom and I came back out and I said, it's time for me to like put my big girl sho shoes on and start like selling cars. So I just got right to it. And within the first month, there was an older gentleman and he said to me, I'll never forget him because he be, he became like my mentor and my leader, but he said, you're never going to sell. And there were some expletives in there. You're never going to sell anything out of that box over there, you know, off that little box computer thing. And I looked at him and I said, if I sell more cars than you this month, your beautiful Italian wife who you rave about her cooking, she's going to cook for all of the salespeople in the dealership. Okay. You're going to have her bring in some food because he always raved about her cooking and you know, you don't get a good meal when you're, <laughs> selling cars so and plus i missed my mom's cooking at that point because she's italian so long story short he sold six cars it was the month of uh november and i sold 12. 
wow. and his wife came in she kissed me on either side of the cheek and um that was it he helped me out from that point forward and um he passed he passed away a couple of years ago mr ed Cervati, and i've had the joy of working with his son ed Cervati jr but um he showed me the ropes he he had my back all of the guys at that point had my back after that and then i just kept getting recruited so i was recruited from one dealership to another dealership and i've i i really worked for a great guy who saw um you know women multitasking and he gave me a great opportunity to work in different capacities so i've been a service manager sales manager finance manager e-commerce director bdc director and then the last um i want to say like four or five years ago i kept getting calls from all these dealers saying can you set up our bdc's and I had a little side hustle going because I didn't have a non-compete with my current dealer. And so I started my little side hustle and my side hustle became my permanent hustle. I said, there's no need for me to, you know, keep doing this if I can do this on my own. And um, my four, we have four children. Our fourth child went to kindergarten in August and I said, okay, now's the time, you know, because I hate to say it when you're working full time and your spouse is working full time, some things kind of fall apart. So especially if you're, have some kids at home like things kind of fall apart so i recently got some help uh, at home and help with the business and i just said now's the time because if i don't do it now i'm gonna have remorse and regret and so that's uh, a little bit how the, the little group started with the automotive bdc and crm form i really wanted to help people um, i wanted people to stop messaging me through facebook <laughs> i'm like i can't answer 50 messages 60 messages a week i have to like move this off of messenger and move it into a group um and i guess it was needed so that's a little bit about my background and my husband is an automotive too so we share in the mutual understanding of how automotive works which is very rare so you know what Herb, that that's what i love about the car business because so many amazing people just like sarah just accidentally find it you know and uh that very similar story how i ended up doing it and and i love how you went from you know that the struggling the person that knew they could just they could grow if, if someone would just give them a chance and, and the car business gave you that and you you took that ball and ran with it and oh my gosh you. and i tried to leave it too i don't know about anybody else but i'm like i gotta get out of this business and then i went into like um selling data and websites and i'm like oh my gosh i'm so bored i need to be around some crazy people <laughs> I need to go back to that like environment of like chaos i'm just so bored so i was i think i was out of it for seven months and i like ran right back into it so it is what it is you you just find your passion i guess you know yeah i think that, that, that that's a, that's very well stated i think uh, you know passion is, is is definitely key and, and look where it's kind of the path that it's taking you on so uh, mm -hmm. I kind of want to start things out because with the with the kind of like the the high level question of the BBC because you know believe it or not I still see a lot of dealers that I can talk with that don't believe in it they don't implement it so to me it's crazy uh, you know to BBC or not to BBC right that's the question is it your question for me to BBC or not to BBC yeah. what do you think I think it depends on your overall environment. If you have salespeople that can do everything from beginning to end, there's no negotiation involved. It's one price. They have everything at their fingertips. Um, they don't have to take a lot of leads. They can take like 70 to a hundred a month. Um, they have people that can help them out if they're off. Uh, they have a manager or even like an assistant that can help them off. I have seen it work. Um, I think the difference is it's such a specialty. You know, it's such a specialty to be able to handle the phone in a very nice customer service environment, make sure the customer's handled, they get what they need, um, they get to hear your value proposition. So BDC agents tend to sell the dealership as a whole. And salespeople are too, like, I want to focus on selling the car. So I have, yes, I have seen it work. I have a couple dealers that had BDCs and they dissolved them. But there's always that what if, you know what I mean? There's always that what if. So um, it can be done. I think the other thing is you really need to have a BDC profit report. You have to have something that says, look, this is what you were making without a BDC. This is what you're making that you would have had if you, if you had one. 
So a lot of dealers aren't marking or checking the overall profitability that they would have lost had they had one. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I guess I, you know, to kind of develop that a little bit, how do you, like, what are some metrics, like, if you're always that, right? Because you don't, like, you don't measure, it's, you don't manage, basically. So when you when you have a BDC, how can you as a as a leader um, kind of measure that and make sure that it is profitable? Like, what are some of, some of the things that you would uh, recommend that they? I'm so to? sorry, I'm not sure why I can't hear you. Am I the only one? Shaw, can you hear him? Okay. I can, I can hear him. So what Herb asked was, you know, when when you talked about the BDC profit report, right? There's a there's a lot of vague and, and nebulous metrics in in the car business, and it's attributions, you know, always a, a concern. So. What do you feel like Herb was asking? What's the best way to measure a BDC success um, and show that it is profitable, in your opinion? The length of time. So I find that if, like, a prime example is like an internet lead, it comes through and that closes within a few days. That's not a great measurement of BDC success. A great measurement of BDC success for me is anything that came through after about, it's been like seven days and they finally take delivery. And that's because they've had diligent follow-up and diligent communication. And there's been some uh, excellent communication that the customer has received. So it, to me, it's very, very time-based. Um, anything that's really been a, a day or a week, a day or three days old, isn't a good um, measurement for BDC success and performance and profit. But when you look past day three, and you have some customers that are coming in that are buying that are like, 30, 60, 90 days old, that's an excellent measurement that, of stuff that you have never had if you didn't have diligent follow-up. Mm -hmm. What about time? I think every single BDC should prospect. So I think that's really lacking um, in the overall uh, scheme of things is the ability to know how to prospect. I'm going to tell you, I don't have a website. Everyone's like, you don't have a website? I don't have a website because social media for me has been so large that I haven't needed one. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have to get one. I mean, I'm in the process of obviously creating a website. I just finished my logo yesterday with the lovely, I think you guys probably know Michelle McLean. McLean she um, created a beautiful logo for me. I needed that for a website first. So long story short, there's a lot of dealers out there that, that aren't on social media. So I'm, I'm missing a key component here. But what a way to prospect every single BBC business development center they should be bringing in their own business outside of what's coming in just to them so call me call me crazy <laughs> <laughs> what about you sean and your you yeah, obviously in your in your travels and, and you know in your consultation with dealerships do you see a lot of them doing bdc do you see it do you see them doing successfully or or um you know like tell me about that yeah to, to answer your question i think i think one of the biggest mistakes that dealers can make um is not deciding either way and, and going all in you know because one of my favorite sayings is he who sits in the middle of the road gets run over so i i, I see dealerships that flip-flop back and forth between well okay let's have a bdc or let's not and they they go back and forth and they're handing off the internet leads to the the sales team one month and the next month they're they have a bdc right or or even worse they're they're changing the responsibilities of the bdc and trying to keep it intact um so frequently you know, you never really get to master something. So I think that it's really important that whatever you're going to do, you decide and then you go all in and then ju not just making that decision on a whim. You know, I love what Sarah said about uh, measuring the, uh, having a BDC profit report that goes beyond just appointments or, or sold because, um, you know, bottom line is this, like, like she was saying, generate their own business, found business can easily be measured. And, um, and, and yeah, giving them the, the skill set and the, the training they need. And that's why Sarah is doing what she's doing so successfully um, because people need the right, they need to know what to say. They need to know what to do, you know? So who are they calling and what are they saying and, and what should they be doing when there is downtime because they can't control the flow of internet leads. So bottom line is this, um, I would say the vast majority of dealers have realized that it's a different, the way you handle a customer on the internet is different from how you handle them in person. And um, to Sarah's point, yeah, get it, you know, selling the dealership and the appointment is different than selling the car. And it yeah. takes a different approach and a different mindset. And I don't think a lot of people, a lot of car salespeople can do both very well. Um, Sarah, would you kind of agree with that? 
Yes, and, and I do have to say, like, I haven't found a, stu a study yet. I mean, everyone talks about Carvana, but I haven't found a study yet where at least 80% of buyers or more want to test drive a car before they purchase it. So you, they have to come to the dealership or the dealership has to make uh, an effort to bring the car to them. So either way, there's a level of customer service that's needed. I had a great question in, in this forum um, this past week and um, it was about, and actually it was a huge, <laughs> it was an email that I got and they're like, do you think that, you know, full uh, digital retailing is really working? And I said, I'm not, you, you can call me crazy, Sean, I haven't seen it where 75% of buyers are coming through and completely doing the digital retailing process. I, I think it's like 10%, uh, 10 to 20%. And then there's sometimes, it, yeah. And then even more, if there is any portion of digital retailing that is working, it's because there's human, human intervention involved. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. What about you? I completely see that with digital retailing, it, customers aren't beating down the door saying, give that to me. It, it's, it's the sale, the dealerships, taking customers and trying to feed them into that program. Um, so yeah, so the dealerships that I have that are, um, do have any decent implementation or utilization of digital retailing, it's because of the dealership pushing for it. So yes, I, I agree with that to 100%. Yeah. So what would you say is the main objective of the BDC? Because uh, I think that that's the, the one thing that there's a lot of confusion with that as, as well, right? Is it, the, is it strictly to like you said have that presence of the dealership and set the appointment or are they supposed to close deals or like what would you say like uh, you know one objective this is what you're going to measure is when you're when you're putting on a bdc uh, dealership is that for me or for sean <laughs> oh, for you sarah <laughs> for me it's everything it's everything nuts to bolts it's complete customer service and handling the customer from beginning to end until all of their needs have met showcasing the dealership and describing exactly what that dealership offers without the customer even needing to be there to the point where you bring them in. Um, having them feel like they're missing out on something or missing out on something by not coming in. Um, it's everything nuts to both. If there's a customer service issue or if there's reputation issues, making sure that that has been handled. All of the follow-up communication that happens within a CRM, making sure you're updating the do not call, the national do not call. There's a ton of just about everything. So it's completely making it look like that customer has been handled from beginning to end um, to the point where they need to come in for an appointment, hopefully. And then on the flip, like I, I'll give you an example. I'm not a person. Uh, when it comes to a car, I'll probably need to come in. But I just purchased a house. I didn't even see it. We did everything. My husband said, I'm going to take you through a virtual tour with my phone. Um, I trust my husband. I think I think he's more high maintenance than I am. Sorry, Tad, you're probably listening to this. But, uh, he he oh, is very way. very specific about how things have to look, um, the layout, and uh, so he hopped on the phone. He did a, a total virtual tour for me, and I said, "I'll take it. Let me work on selling the house up here in New York." So it it depends on the customer and what what their needs are. For me, I was like, "Let me just." sign on the dotted line and let me get to Florida. Okay. But, you know, um, you know it, it, Sarah, I got a question. So I love what you said there, you know, the beginning to the end approach. Now on, on the flip side, I, I think it's, I think it's really hard. And you mentioned, you know, kind of measuring the BDC profit earlier and we kind of touched on that, but you know, when you look at beginning to end, there's a lot of steps in that process. I mean, that to me, the sale process never ends there. there and that's why you mentioned Michelle McLean, right? her awesome follow-up uh, marketing thing, right? Keeping the customer engaged. So if you look at beginning then, you've got engagement as a metric. You've got appointment, you know, so that's the, the percentage of contacts for you people that don't know BDC thoroughly. You got engagement, you got appointment set, appointment show, you got closing, do they buy a car or not? And then you've got retention um, and service. So what should, you know, when it comes to BDC stats, I guess here's the big one, in my opinion, should BDC people be paid on appointment sold? So here's my biggest hang up was sold. And that's my biggest hang up right now. Sarah, you need to generate traffic. You need to get people in. Okay, so we work, we get all these people in. Now they don't get they don't even take delivery. So here I am, I build all this traffic for you. We get a set ratio of like 45, 50%. We get a show ratio of 50, 55, 60%. 
Now I have dealers that have a sold ratio of like 7%. I'm like, there's something going on when they get to the dealership if you cannot close them. So here's my thing when it comes to sold. I, I prefer a compensation plan, and I, this was in one of my lives already, where you get paid uh, after a certain amount of shows have arrived. And it's just like sales. You get a beautiful commission. Uh, you get a stepping stone, but maybe your salary is up to a certain point, and then your carrot starts after 10 or 20 shows. Not one show. Like one show is like, that's all you got for the whole month. Why are you getting a bonus on that? So I like to see it like 10 or 20 shows, throw a little carrot out in front of them. I like to pay more on a show. That was their job to get people to come into the dealership. Um, I don't mind the ones that live five hours away and they've had to do some extra work. We had to like get the figures. We had they like give them, give them something for that. That's like a phone show. You got as far as you could with that customer to get them in. Sold. Uh, most dealers I have, they they refuse to not pay them if they're un, unsold. But I prefer that to be a much smaller portion of their bonus than on a show. Because not for anything, unless you're going to put your elite batters to the table or a gold team or, or people who can close these customers when you get in. Now you've got, you got an experienced BDC agent who's been doing this for 10 years and a salesperson who has no idea how to use the CRM trying to sell a car for a week. And now who, who wants that beautiful customer to go to that guy? You know? So okay. I, I just have a hard time on the sold part of it because I think that hurts the, the true. I, do you feel the same way, Sean? Call me weird. Yeah. But. No, I, I'm with you because at the end of the day, they're not, it's, it's not their job to close the sale. And um, the, the, the big challenge comes in, right? When, when, you, when you pay on sold or you don't pay on sold, that's when the the culture of the dealership and the communication and the alignment is so critical because your sales team and your BDC team they've got to you know trust each other right, right. and if if the sales team feels mm -hmm. like and claims that well the BDC is just giving us bad people and that's why we can't close them because they don't get paid on the sold then they you know they get that mindset so yeah. it, it, bottom line is this to me I, I I coach salespeople all the time I'm like well what do you mean it's a bad customer. Like help me understand that that's a bad if, if you have an opportunity to talk to someone and they were willing to drive to your dealership your mindset should be this is a this is an opportunity for me that i wouldn't have had otherwise and what else would you be doing like staring out the window i mean so right. I, I think i'm with you 100 percent on that and why would you give it to a guy that's been there for a week and why hasn't that guy done any training through the bdc first like to me i love bdc's as training centers like the person after a year after you have been at a bdc for a year and you're doing a hundred phone calls a day, you're about done. You, it's like purgatory. You've put in your time and you need to <laughs> Some people love it. They absolutely love doing those hundred calls a day. I just find half of the BDC is like, okay, what's the next move for me? I'm, I'm ready for bigger, better and bigger things. And I have salespeople, you're like, oh my gosh, you don't even know how to use the CRM, how to talk on the phone. I have more experienced BDC agents than I do in the dealership. And, and I got to tell you, Sean, you tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not a big fan of paying people on an appointment set. I'd rather pay them on a show. I have dealers that are like, oh, she set 250 appointments and I paid her a dollar per appointment. And then they have like 50 of them show. Like the metrics don't, <laughs> they're focusing on the dollar instead of the uh, I had a little. I, I'm having a little internet issues. Herb, can you understand? Do you want to do that? Yeah. No. I. I. I yeah. No. I. I agree. I. Um. It, you know. And I kind of wanted to develop that a little bit because, I. Um. You know. I liked what you said there about about um starting in in the BDC, right? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it was John Welsh who talked about that recently in his podcast. But it was like that should be like a training center. I, that's what I call it. I call it the training center. Yeah, and think about not just you know all the things like you know it, it gets that person ready to, to to make the calls and to be proactive versus just waiting for the up right. Right. But at, at the same time, think about the product knowledge, right? That opportunity to learn your inventory, learn your brand, learn learn your product, and then when you're out now, when you're on the showroom floor, you're just that much more knowledgeable. And today, with the efficient markets, with the efficient market that we live in, and the transparency portion. Sometimes the, the customers are, are ahead of us on, on the product knowledge, and that's when we when we lose the trust factor. Mm -hmm. So so I love that. Do you have dealers that are currently do that? Do you see a difference in, in 
um, you know, and, and performance because of that that setup? I think I'm very blessed. The, the last two dealers I worked for, one specifically, uh, I was there for five years and our BDC was our recruitment center. So I recruited agents and after a year, it was they had a 90 day performance evaluation. I mean, I held myself very accountable. The dealership also held me very accountable. And I have, um, I have agents that moved up as salespeople, as managers. I have one as a general manager of a store right now. Like they started off with me and you can tell, like you just know you're looking at someone. I think you know, Sean, you tell me if you're wrong, but after years in automotive, it's, it's like you know if the person should be with you in automotive after like five minutes of speaking to them. And I feel very blessed that not only are they able to now take care of themselves, but they're also able to take care of their families and they've moved up within the business. And now they have a true belief, like this is how it should be. We should be starting everybody here, having not only, how many, how many BDCs have you been to and they don't know how to put the customer on hold, how to put the customer on park, how to transfer. I'm like, you don't know how to use the phone. So if a BDC doesn't know how to use the phone, how would the salesperson know how to use the phone? So I just, I just laugh. It should be your overall, it's 90 days of onboarding. I call it the 90 days of onboarding, everything from nuts to bolts. Some people are four weeks. Some people are 16 weeks. It depends on the But you need to onboard there and then move them into sales. It, 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 especially if they're good face-to-face. -face. I hate to say it. Some BDC agents, like they're like, look, I like to wear my sweatpants and my hat, and I don't want to be in front of people. But you can tell when someone's ready, when they're like, put me out on the floor, please. I'm, I'm ready to go. What about that relationship between the sales department and the BDC agent when you do it that way, right? Do you think that it's better because yeah. they started there and, and there's not so much of that animosity as well? There's empathy. They have total empathy right. and, and they understand why things ha are happening and they're, they, they're well, um, they're well trained. Like they know exactly what to do, why it needs to be done that way. And they follow the processes better and they really know the CRM. Like CRMs are complicated. They're very robust and you need to be able to know those systems in and out. So I find that there's much more empathy for the BDC agents when that transition occurs. It's ironic that we're talking about this. So I'm in a Nissan dealer in Jersey and the office, the room behind me is a BDC and uh, we've started over the last six months doing, you know, having the sales team on board for the BDC to your yeah. uh, recommendation, Sarah. And the, so the, the, I was coaching a sales, a future salesperson in there now. And he was talking about building his own personal brand on social media and how he was going to wait until he hit the showroom floor. And so I coached on that mindset and helped him realize that um, if he starts now, by the time yeah. when he does hit the showroom floor, he'll have a following and it'll give him a nice jump start versus waiting, right? So it's pretty cool that, you know, I, I love that we're aligned in those beliefs. And and I want to ask you now, this is the, you know, for stores that have a separate BDC and, and sales department where they don't, don't do that, you know, you often hear salespeople um, the sales floor complains about, well, the BDC keeps giving prices over the internet. They're giving our cars away, right? So what, when should a dealership in your, in your opinion, when should a dealership give pricing over the internet? When should a BDC do it? And when shouldn't they? What's your thoughts on that? This is 2019. If you are not prepared to do pricing in 2019, you might as well just put a big close sign on your door. That's just my opinion. This is to, everything has a price on it. Houses have a price on it. You can talk to somebody before you even buy the house, up, you know, about it. We did. We didn't even like see, we didn't even do, like, if you could do it for a house, why couldn't you do it for a car? So this is 2019. It's the age of transparency and authenticity. Um, if you're expecting people just to not come in, I mean, let, let's face it. There's a Nissan, Toyota, Honda. They're all kind of similar in a way. They are a little bit different in appearance. All their warranties are about the same about the same product. Now they're all about on every single model trend, like a thousand dollars apart from each other, you know? So basically you have to get in that range. Um, and I have to say, I, I think manufacturers want you to go in that direction. Look at some of the Nissan sites, like the, it's on a manufacturer site. They have pricing posted minus discounts, minus rebates. So pretty much the manufacturers are also pushing us in that direction to move in that direction. I think if you don't want to, and, and I think you're, you're lucky with used cars, completely different used cars. If you're using the products and the tools that are at hand, um, you really don't need to negotiate a lot over the phone. If you want to negotiate, get your price, your best price. We can do all that when you come in. 
new cars, you can put it out there. Um, and let's just face it, salespeople do it anyways. They can say the BDC is the one doing it. I haven't seen a salesperson that's not doing it either. You know, you're not going to get my business. I'm not going to come in unless you're giving the best price. Well, everyone's sweating it out, you know. So, and I, I think the other thing is, in my opinion, I train to do it over the phone. I don't think it's a good idea to do it by email unless you want them to print it out and forward it to the next competitor. That's just my thing. But I don't know, Sean, you tell me if I'm wrong. Do you think like stick, stick to your guns and stick to full MSRP and hope that they come in? <laughs> no, I, I say 5,000 over MSRP. And no, I'm joking. <laughs> <You're tired. laughs> no, I, I think Sarah, what, what I think is important is that everyone at the dealership's on the same page and, and you've got a process for it. So the first time the customer asks for a price, you know, um, what do you do? The second time when, when they bring it up again, what do you do next? And, and the third time, and as long as everyone's on a line, right? So, you know, some of my, I always cost, I do coaching. So everything, I don't have an off the shelf, like this is the best way, but what's the best way for them is what I always try to uncover. So I have some dealerships that, you know, Hey, it's the pricing is just like you see on the internet. What website are you calling it on? Well, let me walk you through it. And, and then I have other dealerships that are like, when the customer asks about price, just no problem. We'll send you a proposal and they do a full proposal. So I guess it's just depend, depends on that dealership and the culture and what, what are they trying to, uh, you know, convey what, what, what values and message are they trying to convey? So I don't that, know, like last week I did a quick value proposition class. You don't have to be the best price. If you have some value that you have at your dealership, you have a service program, you have a point yeah. reward system, you offer free oil changes. You do birthday details. You have a free car wash on Saturday. For me, I pay, believe it or not, I pay for better service. Um, I just bought a necklace. I, that was part of the whole thing. Like I bought a necklace. They cleaned my rings. They got my Christmas list, list all set for my husband so he didn't have to wonder what he should be buying me. They um, donate to charity, which for me, any company that really donates to charity, you already pulled up my string, like my heartstrings. So I'm going to buy from you because you, you found my weakness. So if you happen to know like what really, really uh, moves your client, you don't have to be the best price because you do, you have a value package that far exceeds your best price. So. Yeah. You need yeah, to you know know. And to your point, I, I think that's so critical that, that the, everyone knows, knows what that value package is and communicates that in every interaction, whether it's over the phone, through a video or in person. And, um, and, and to your point, you know, it's like, there's so many, there's so many situations where we just focus so robotically on the price because that's what the customer brings up. But at the end of the day, they wouldn't have sent you their information if they didn't like what they saw. Right. So either it's the, the perfect vehicle or they've already shopped. They already have seen how you stack up pricing wise and they're willing to work with you. So yeah, I completely agree with you. It's like, how do you take the focus off the big picture or off the, just the price and, and help them focus on the big picture, which is the value that you bring. That's awesome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know in that communication too, right? I think that plays into it. Like you have to, you have to make that a part of, like you said, every interaction, every time you, know, you got to, that's gotta be your message, right? So. Like I have, I have, uh, I have my one example is Billy, Billy Joe Bob. Billy Joe Bob had me come in and I'm, I'm like, what are your values? Why should anyone buy from you? He's like, well, we have free coffee. And I'm looking at his coffee pot going, dude, that coffee pot over there with the beautiful Starbucks <laughs> coffee, that's fantastic. But you have not cleaned that coffee pot in about 20 years. I pulled it all apart. There's like black stuff hanging from the, from the coffee thing. I, I'm pretty sure I just got some type of like illness from drinking out of it. So that's not a value. You telling me that um, you're giving six months, 6,000 miles of powertrain warranty, like that's not a value. That is a lemon law from your state. Okay. So there's, <laughs> <laughs> you're just letting the customer know like legally what they get for free. Okay. And if anything, you're, they're kind of wondering if you're stupid or if they're stupid for not knowing. It's kind of like a back, the backhanded compliment. Like, hey, you're getting a six month, 6,000 mile powertrain warrant you're like that i would have gotten for free yeah. <laughs> from anywhere <laughs> oh, that's awesome. so i kind of wanted to um uh change things up a little bit and talk about ai because there's a lot of that going on particular a company that uh it's called conversica and mm -hmm. a lot of I, I have a lot of dealers that are calling it their secret weapon 
Um, but I can't, I can't just, I can't wrap my mind around the concept of having a um, artificial intelligence, which, which I cringe every time I hear that in our in our space in the, in the industry. But having that, um, that technology um, offer something that's more personal than than a person. So, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you see that as maybe something that can aid but not replace, or um, you know? Maybe I, but, I, so, yeah. be, one, one, I'd like to add to Herb's question too. Like, so there, I, I, there, I saw a CRM. So there's a CRM called Drive Centric that has AI built in, and I saw it like setting an appointment the other day. I'm like, this a CRM as AI setting an appointment. Great. So uh, yeah, well, it is a great question, Herb. I'm glad you brought that up for Sarah here. She's so from my personal standpoint, I have mystery shopped Conversica and AI several times. For me, I have not had an experience where I am there yet. I'm going to tell you, I think it's going to be great in about three to five years. Then it's going to be like, hold on to your you know, seats. It's probably now is the time to really start thinking about AI. I've had, and it's not just through automotive, it's through multiple different types of businesses. I've had a very good AI experience through chat. I'm asking questions, it's answering them right away. I know it's AI, I know it's not a live person. They directed me to the right place. I, I was, was I totally blown away? No, I, in, a, in a way I felt like it was the dealership's chief effort of not having a live person there. Tell me what it is. Tell me that's just too. That's just me. It's not because I don't I want to replace people's jobs. It's that's just how, my personal female opinion of AI. I I like human interaction. I my my mother in law will say it best. She calls me an extreme extrovert, and I just love human interaction. So for me, that's it's like the cheap way of kind of taking that out of there. Now for Conversica, for me, I have mystery shop then. Um, I do, I love technology. Uh, and I will tell you, I started selling cars. I never even knew how to use a computer for the position that I had. I, I didn't really use the computer a lot before I started selling cars online. I basically went online for the first time when I was buying a car. So for me, since then, my progression of using technology, my first Facebook Live was like, what, six weeks ago? <laughs> my, my progression of using technology goes very, very quick once I'm onto it. So I think eventually uh, Conversica will be good. I don't think it's there yet. Um, and... I think it's because um, they couldn't answer all the questions and I was getting frustrated to the point where I'm like, please let me talk to a human. So, and I'm not going to say the dealers that I mystery shopped, but I mystery shopped. It just didn't, it just didn't work. I think a trained person could better answer the questions than the AI software could. But down the road, I think three to five years, we better hold on to our seats. I think it's there. What do you think about the follow-up portion? Because that's a lot of, when, I, when I'm consulting with dealers and we have those conversations, their whole thing is like, yeah, but the follow-up is impeccable and, and, and you know, they do it until either the customer tells them to stop or, you know, or they actually set an appointment or they get to the objective. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, do, you, do you see that? I don't see the follow-up matching. I see more errors than I see, but I see it from both. I laugh. I have people that don't fully read what a customer has sent in and then their templated email that they didn't take the time to customize for the for the person doesn't match their original correspondence. I'm seeing that error for both human and AI. Like you just need to slow down a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't match for me. The call, my level of, of um, expectation is really, really high. So I just have high expectation that when a customer you're communicating with them, they're going to get not only what they asked for, but for 10 more things on top of that. And that's not something that AI can do right now. AI cannot send you a beautiful personalized video. Yeah. I, I that, and that's, that's what I always go back to. It's like, you know, why take a chance, right? If you're, if experience is the one, the one, the main differentiator yeah. right now on the market that we live in and the, in the, in the landscape that we're in, why take a chance on offering a subpar experience before the customer ever even gets here? Like I just right. don't, you know, it's too much of a risk in my opinion, but I, I wanted to get your, your take on it. Yeah. I, I mean, ask me the same question in a few years and I'll probably have a different answer for you, but that's, I just, I, when I'm presenting something to a dealer, I have to be 90% confident in what I'm talking about and, and the, the firm belief in what I'm selling them. Like I really can't sell something I don't believe in. I just, 
it, it needs a little bit more improvement. Sorry, sorry if they're not, if they're listening. Like they're, I know I'm gonna be. Hey, why don't we set up a demo? I'm gonna get the demo call tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that I, so my belief, Sarah, is that the last the last step in the world is, you know, is digital relationship development. And it, so it, it's no longer delivery or follow up. So at the end of the day, AI can never develop a relationship because it's just not a person. And, and you know, if, if, if and I've seen well managed BCs with leaders, uh, people like Sarah training them, um, or phenomenal managers that where the the team does the, the best follow up I've ever seen because it's not just timely. But it's relevant and it's personalized, like she mentioned with the video. And you know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Video is worth a million. It, you, so yes, I, I'm I'm I lean towards that. There's no better follow up than human interaction, and that's the, the relationship development, which you can't get from AI. So that that's that's my opinion on that. So. And I think that those are part of your ten percent people. They're like the I'm the extreme extrovert. They're the extreme introvert. They don't they don't want to deal with people. I find that to be much smaller than the people that really want some um, nurturing. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of nurturing when you're going into a heavy purchase decision. Right. Uh, so we're getting close to that time. I definitely wanted to give you a moment to uh, you know, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and how they can connect with you. Um, obviously, I, I, I'd love for them to follow you on, on your Facebook page. And if you're okay, um, I'd like to put all that in the show notes. Um, Going ahead. Her, group, her group is amazing. There's so much value in her Facebook group, Sarah. I love what you're posting in there. Keep it up. Oh my gosh, I have to tell you, I was like, eh, let me just try it and see if it works. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's 200 people in there. Oh my gosh, there's 500 people. So right now, I think we're we're headed towards 1,200 in like six weeks. But I also just started a LinkedIn group. So it's the Automotive BDC and CRM Forum. Between the two groups, there's 1,200 people in there within like a six week period um you can really find me facebook instagram linkedin a lot of people i have a lot of recommendations on linkedin from former dealers and people i have trained any anyway through social media or you can just reach me at sarah without an h s-a-r-a at elitebdc.com but i'm happy to help anyone i was like this is my first podcast i was like so excited thank you so much for having me no thanks for coming on i uh um, yeah, so we're going to have all everything on the show notes, so make sure to go there, connect with Sarah, follow, go to her group, check it out. Lots of good content, lots of good information. Um, there's one question that I ask everybody that comes on the show, but before I ask you that, I wanted to, to touch on what you said about video because I think that's huge, and I think that we're missing the boat a lot on that. Um, in, on the BDC side of things, can you tell us a little bit about that, share, share maybe some tips or something to, uh, as, a, as a lead behind for the, for the audience? One of the major tips I'm going to tell you right now is um, make sure when you're recruiting people that you ask them if they're going to be prepared to do video for your BDC because a lot of agents are so used to, if you're recruiting for them, they really don't want to look glam every day. They don't want to look nice every day. They really don't want to, you know, look, look a certain way on video. So make sure you're asking that before you hire them. Make sure that you ask them if they're prepared to use their cell phone for work purposes, for commission. So those are two main things when it comes to video. If they're not prepared and you can't get someone on board, I hate to say it, but I'm starting to shoot actual video clips for dealers right now. They're like, you know what, Sarah, my staff, they don't want to do that, but you seem like you'd be good at it, so why don't you come to our dealership? And every dealership should have about 10 set videos. You need like, hey, you're walking in for your appointment. When you walk in, park right here. Walk through these two doors. Come here, come here, follow Sarah. Here's the manager that you're going to meet. So you need like an appointment video, a service video, a, hey, we missed you. You're going to come in video. Um, hey, I'm trying to get in touch with you. There's a, there's 10 canned videos that every single dealership needs. And if the problem that you're having is you can't get people that want to do this for you, well, then I guess you got to work with myself. And uh, I tend to work with I don't know if we're supposed to name drop here, but I tend to work with QuickPage a little bit on some of that. So, um, but you do, you have people you're like, oh my gosh, I have some dealers like, please don't put that person on camera. Like, can we keep that person off and put the rest of the people on? Like, so unfortunately, if if you have um, people who are shy and usually they're, they're shy in front of other people too. Sean probably sees it too. They're like, don't want to be physically present. They want to be present on the phone. Then you're gonna have to find the right person and right Clip, uh, presenter, maybe your spokesperson, to do these hand clipped videos for your dealership. Setting expectations um, before you hire them so so important. And I, I even recommend 
testing them for competency, you know, like before every interview, you know, if you conduct multiple interviews, maybe ask them to send you a video um, and see how it looks, you know, um, it's a great way to test that out. And I have, if they're not showing up for a video, do a FaceTime video, because if they don't look appropriate on the FaceTime video, there's no need for an in-person video. <laughs> right on. <laughs> That's funny. I, I had a salesperson send me a video once because I used to test out their video and he was smoking in the video and I said, yeah, I could imagine him smoking with an up, so I decided not to hire that guy. <laughs> yeah, real life. Um, yeah, a, a on the video, but uh, um, no on the, on the presentation. I mean, it matters, right? I mean, if you're, if you're going to put yourself on there. I hate to say it, sometimes you have to be all. I have dealers where they're on video, they're a BDC agent, they're full service, so they're working numbers. And then I have some that are like, do you think they can start submitting applications to the banks for us? And I'm like, are you prepared to pay this person like $150,000 or $200,000 a year? Because you pretty much want them to do just about everything for you. And you get to the point where they're they're more valuable than your general manager is at some point. So yeah, yeah, you got a little, got to uh, work on some of that, but that's okay. All right, Sean, any more questions? No, sir. It's been awesome having Sarah on the show. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so thanks. great to meet you, Sean. You as well, yeah. We've been, we've been, yeah. We're, we're going to connect again soon. I'm, I'm excited for our next combo. Likewise. Yeah. Thanks so much for for the time. I really appreciate it. This has been awesome. I'm going to put you on the spot and invite you back for for part two because there's lots and lots more things that we could talk about. Um, there is one question that I ask everybody that comes on the show, and that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years, and why? Oh, I should have prepared. I should have watched some of these before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned. I'm concerned that some of the manufacturers are not going to make it and that our selection of what we're going to be able to choose from is, is going to start diminishing. So it's like survival of the fittest. I hate to say it. I think there's a survival of the fittest that's going to be happening. In my opinion, I this is like a hope for me. Um, for manufacturers in general, right now, there's a lot of them that give out a ton of incentives to bring customers to the dealership. So they pay all this money for co-op, for reimbursement, for advertising. And I think manufacturers are starting to see, we're paying, we're doing all the co-op money to bring customers in, but when they get in, we need to start paying for the training portion of it. So I'm hoping to see that within the next year or two, I'm begging manufacturers to stop, not so much stop on the uh, co-oping of incentive, like uh, the advertising, the radio, the TV, all of that. But there has to be some type of assistance when it comes to the training portion of it to really, really help full circle. I mean, your employee satisfaction starts at the top. If they're happy, the customer's happy, the customer's happy, it comes full circle and the dealership is happy. We need to, we're missing that missing link and that missing link is training. So I think we're going to see an increase in some of the, the future products that our customers are going to have the ability to purchase. And I also am hoping that they, that the right ones that want to move forward, start co-oping for training. There it is. There you have it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Sarah, thanks again. Sean, thank you for co-hosting with me, man. Always um, a pleasure, bro. It's fun. It's always a good time. Um, that's all the time we have for today, folks. Um, one more thing. If you haven't done so, please, please make sure to share this podcast. If you like this episode, share this episode so people can take this information back to the dealership and implement it in their day-to-day. -day. That's all we have. And as usual, we'll talk later. Later.